scripture reading this evening comes from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Good evening. I certainly hope that you have had a wonderful day and that your afternoon has gone well and we thank you for being here again tonight. What a joy it is for me to have been here today. I enjoyed our being together in worship this morning and I would like to express my gratitude to you for that wonderful meal that you've provided following our worship this morning. It was truly delicious, and uh, I, uh, I made myself at home, and I, I, I ate, you know, uh, very well. And then that piece of pie I had afterwards, I said, it lo this looks like uh, county fair apple pie. And uh, so uh, I, I ate it, and when I was done, I, uh, my assessment was it was a blue ribbon county fair uh, pie. But I appreciate very much uh, the opportunity to, to be with you and to enjoy our fellowship together. And uh, I appreciate Brother Andy putting up with me this afternoon. And uh, he took good care of me and I enjoyed our time together and visiting and, and uh, spending a little time. We, we see each other, uh, we, we, we cross paths here at the school and outside of that we don't get a lot of time to, to visit. And so I really enjoyed our time this afternoon and I appreciate me interrupting perhaps a really good nap that he would have gotten otherwise. Uh, but but I, I thank him for that hospitality. Good to be with you again tonight. I, uh, thankful for the reading of that scripture just a few moments ago. And if you would like, you may turn to that particular passage. We're going to take a look at that this evening from Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. As we consider this idea tonight of trusting in the Lord. Trusting in the Lord. Uh, we, we talk about faith and we talk about trust and we talk about those things. Uh, but what does it really mean? And what does it mean to us? And what is our understanding of that idea? When we look to Solomon, Solomon's got some things to say about that. And this particular passage has some really good instruction for us when it comes to the idea of our faith and trust in Almighty God. The day before his 52nd birthday, Abraham Lincoln left Springfield, Illinois to travel by train to Washington, D.C. to serve as President of the United States. And with the threat of civil war looming, he said goodbye to the friends and neighbors that had come to see him off and to bid him farewell. And seeing the gathering of people that was there, Lincoln took that opportunity to say some words to them. Uh, he, I don't know what was going through his mind and I don't know what his assessment was. I assume that he had an appreciation for those who perhaps had traveled miles to gather there to see him off as he went to the nation's capital, capital to lead this country at a very difficult time in our history. And so we see that Lincoln uh, stood before those people with a message to them that we now refer to as Lincoln's farewell address. It was very brief and yet very powerful. And so to those who had gathered there, he said on that occasion, I now leave not knowing when or whether ever. I may return with a task before me greater than that which rested upon George Washington. Without the assistance of the divine being who ever attended him, I cannot succeed. With, the, with that assistance, I cannot fail. Trusting, trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good, let us confidently hope that all 
will be well. To his care, commending you. As I hope in your prayers, you will commend me. I bid you an affectionate farewell. There's been a lot of debate about Abraham Lincoln and his spirituality. And there, I suppose everyone's got an opinion about that. There are those that contend that Abraham Lincoln was an atheist, that he did not believe in God. There are others that would contend otherwise. I would be among them. I don't believe that Abraham Lincoln was an atheist, although I would say this, that early on in life, he had a very difficult circumstance in life. That he was born in very poor circumstances. His mother died when he was very young. And he was raised by, uh, uh, let's just say, a possibly abusive father. And as such, we see that uh, he struggled with things in life. And I think that there was a period of time when he asked the question of whether or not there was a God. And I think there was a time in his life that he wondered whether or not there was a God. And I think that all of us go through periods like that when we're young. And we ask that question, is there a God? And we, there's nothing wrong with questioning that. What's wrong is, is that we don't seek the answer for that and we don't arrive at the proper answer at that. But Lincoln went through a period of time where he questioned that. But it has become evident that through it all, he did great investigation, finding the answer to that question. And it appears to me that he did great investigation in the Bible to find the answer to that question. And the result of that was that he not only was a believer in God, but I want to ask you the question tonight, what God? What God? You know, people have different ideas about God and who God is. And there are lots of folks that claim to believe in God, but they don't believe in the same kind of God that you and I believe in. What kind of God did Abraham Lincoln believe in? Let me suggest to you four things this evening in regard to that. I'd like for you to think about for just a moment that Abraham Lincoln believed in an omnipotent God. That is a God who is all-knowing. A God who knows all things. That there's nothing that God does not know. Notice that he says here, without the assistance of the divine being who ever attended to Washington, I cannot succeed. And without that assistance, I cannot fail. Doesn't that indicate omnipotence in the God that he believed in? What Lincoln was conceding here is, this is not dependent upon me, it's dependent upon God. Lincoln was saying that, it doesn't, it's not so much in how great I am, it's how great my faith in Almighty God is. That He has the power and my ability to succeed or to fail is dependent upon the power of God. But we notice secondly that Abraham Lincoln believed in an omnipresent God. He says that with that assistance I cannot fail, trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere. That's an omnipresent God. A God, he says, who can go with me and he'll be with me in Washington while at the same time being with you here in Springfield, Illinois. An omnipresent God. But thirdly, I'd suggest to you that Abraham Lincoln believed in an omnibenevolent God. A God who is good. A God who is all good. Again, 
Lincoln says, trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for what? Be everywhere for good. For good. That's what God is for. God is for good. And what God does is good. And Lincoln believed in an omnibenevolent, good God. But then, fourthly, I'd suggest to you that Lincoln believed in an omniscient God. A God who knows all. A God who knows everything. He says, to his care, commending you. As I hope in your prayers, you will commend me. Now when you consider that, what is he saying? He's saying that when you offer your prayers, God will hear your prayers. And when I utter my prayers, God will hear mine. He believed in a God who could, who could know the prayers of all people everywhere. All at the same time. That requires an omniscient God. An all-knowing God. Now I ask you this. Isn't that the same God we believe in? That's the God of the Bible. A God who is omnipotent. Omnipresent. Omnibenevolent. And omniscient. That's the God we believe in. And that's the God that Abraham Lincoln said on that day. That he was placing the care of this country in. Is the hands of Almighty God. Now from Lincoln, we have a great example of kindness. We have a great example of of integrity, we have a great example of courage, we have a great example of character, and on and on we perhaps could go. And yet, we can also learn from him how to face a daunting future with a confident hope in our Lord. In our text that we read just a few moments ago, we see that Solomon instructs us to have complete trust in Almighty God. As we live our life, is it the case that we live our life trusting fully with everything that we have, the God of heaven? That's what Solomon tells us that we ought to do. And so what I would like for us to do is to turn our attention to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. And I'd like for us to observe some things here that hopefully will help us in our trust in the Lord. Let's begin tonight by noticing, first of all, the command. These words begin with a command. Solomon begins in verse 5 by saying, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. That's a simple statement, is it not? That's very simple. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. If I ask you the question tonight, how many of us believe that we trust in the Lord with all of our heart? I believe every hand in this, in this room will go up tonight. That we trust in the Lord with all of our heart. I would agree with that. I want to think that deep within my heart that I believe in God with everything that I have. With every fiber of my being that I trust in the Lord with everything that I've got. Listen, as a child of God, we recognize our own inabilities, our own weaknesses. And when we have a better understanding of our own weaknesses and our own frailties, it is easier for us to put our faith and trust in Almighty God. None of self and all of thee. And day by day to walk, trusting that God is looking over us. Not overlooking us, but looking over us. With a watchful eye, and caring for us as we daily live our lives. Solomon says, trust in the Lord. I want you to notice two things here. The first of which is faith. He's speaking of faith. What does he say? Trust. Trust in the Lord. 
not everybody does that. Not everybody will do that. But God's people do. Those who are wise do. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But those who say that there is a God are not any better off if they do not put their trust in the Lord. What good does it do us to believe that God exists or to acknowledge the existence of God and then not trust in the God of heaven? We're no better off. We must not only acknowledge the existence of God, but we must believe that with all of our heart, but believing that with all of our heart still causes us to fall short. You know why? Because believing that with all of our heart must lead to our placing our trust. Do I trust God? It's one thing to believe that God is. It's another thing altogether to trust in the God that I claim to believe in. Do you follow me on that? Do I really believe in God? Do I trust in God? That's going to be determined by whether or not or to what extent I believe in the promises of God. You see, I will only believe in the promises of God to the extent that I trust in the person behind those promises. There's a very interesting verse in Hebrews chapter 11. If you'd like to turn to Hebrews chapter 11 for just a moment. You know that. That's the great faith chapter of the Bible. And in that chapter we find great figures such as Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and all of those great people of faith that we find in that great chapter of faith in the Bible. But one that we don't often talk about is found in verse 11. In verse 11, the Bible says this, By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age. Now, don't you think about that. You know that story. You know how that was. She was well past the age of childbearing. But God had made a promise. Her husband was in the same boat. They were old people. I mean, older than me. That's how old they were. Older than me when God made that promise. Now, God made that promise that Sarah would have a son. But God wasn't very swift in fulfilling that promise, was he? 25 years later, God got around to fulfilling that promise. Now put yourself in Abraham and Sarah's shoes there. Would you have been weakened by the passing of time? Would your faith be wavering in all of that time? Did God really mean what he said? The Bible says that Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Did you get that? Here's how she could have faith in that. Here's how she trusted in that. Her trust was not in the promise. Her trust was in the one who made the promise. And that's what I'm saying to you. That's where, we, that's where we are. You see, whether or not I can really truly say that I trust in God is going to be determined by how much I trust in the promises of God. And I will only believe in the promises of God to the extent that I trust in the person behind those promises, and that is God Himself. Let us notice that I only believe in those promises to the extent that I trust in the purpose of God for me and for my life. Think about Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. You know that verse. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and those who have been called according to His purpose. God has a purpose for us. God has given purpose to our life. His meaning 
Listen, when we understand where we are in the great scheme of things, that we're a child of God, and God loves us, and God cares for us, and He has a purpose for you, God doesn't just know His people. He knows you. He knows you. And He cares for you. And He has a purpose for your life. Those who are called according to His purpose. Now you may have plans and you may have all these things about your life. But don't forget that God has a purpose for your life. I'll only believe in the promises of God to the extent that I trust in the plan. In the plan of God for me. God has a plan for my life. God has a plan for your life. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 37. You might want to keep your finger at Psalm 37 for just a couple of minutes. But in Psalm 37, notice with me uh, verse 23, if you will. There, the psalmist said, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Now what does that mean? It means that a good man is a man that's willing to allow God to determine the direction of his life. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. We submit to the will of the Lord for, uh, in our life. And we know that God has a plan for our life. That God has a purpose for our existence. And we're relying upon God to direct us in the life that we live. Well, more specifically, what would that be? You know over in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, we see that the Apostle Paul said something of great import in that regard. In Ephesians 2 and verse 10, Paul said this, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now why are we here? What is our purpose in life? God has a plan and a purpose for our life. And what is that? We, he says, are created. We're created by God. We are created unto good works. And what should we do? We should walk in them. You know, it's very akin to what the Bible says about Jesus in the book of Acts. And the Bible says there, that while Jesus was on this earth, he went about doing good, didn't he? He went about doing good. And I think that this verse is really saying that we ought to follow in the footsteps of Jesus in that regard. In that, as we live our life, what is it that God wants us to be doing? He wants us to be doing good. He wants us to do good in our life. Whatever we do, we ought to do good. You know, God's people, for example, practice the golden rule. You know that, doing to others as you'd have them doing to you kind of thing. What is that? That's doing good. That's doing good. You know, I, you all are so wonderful. You are so wonderful about so many things. But, I, I, you know, I've noticed that you all are especially good at sending out cards. All kinds of cards. Sympathy cards, get well cards, thinking of you cards, maybe birthday cards. You do that. You do it well. You know what that is? That's doing good. The good that that accomplishes. That people know, somebody's thinking of me today. When I get a card, somebody's thinking of me. And it lifts my spirits. It cheers my heart. It thrills my soul. And the good that's done, because somebody thought of me. You are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works that you may walk in them. 
That's a people who trusts in God. That's a people who not only believe in God, but trust in the promises of God. Some trust in businesses. Some trust in their jobs. Some trust in their homes. Some trust in their bank account. And on and on and on we could go. That's a kind of a never-ending list. But we notice here that what Solomon says doesn't include any of that. What he said was, trust in the Lord. God alone is worthy of supreme trust. Going back to Psalm 37, look at verses 3, three through 5. Psalm 37, look at verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He shall bring it to pass. In our Psalms class, I sometimes point out to the students, hey, if you ever need a good sermon, right here it is. Right here it is. Look. Uh, look, look at what David says here. David gives us the key here to living a good life, to being successful in life. Verse 3, he says, trust in the Lord. Verse 4, delight in the Lord. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. And you know what that'll give you? You know what that'll produce for you? In verse 7, you'll be able to rest in the Lord. Now that sounds like the gospel plan right there. That's the key to success. That's the key to happiness. All of that. But twice in those words, twice in those verses, what do you have? Trust in the Lord. Now Solomon had all of those other things. He had intelligence. He had a job. He had a home. He had a family. He had all of those things. But he didn't trust in them. He didn't advise us to trust in them. He said trust in the Lord. Not only do we notice faith here, secondly, let us notice the focus. Here we see that Solomon said, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. I love that part. Here he's talking about our focus. Our focus is not when we're scattered out here, you know, and we're trusting in all of these things. He wants us to focus. He wants us to, he wants to, us to bring it in, to channel our faith, to channel our, our trust, and to focus it on one source and one source alone, and that is the God of heaven. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. With all your heart. Don't be divided in your devotion. But you gather it all together and you give it all to God. Not to here, not to there, not to something else. But you give it all to God. Trust in the Lord. Well, with what? With all your heart, with everything that you have. Turn with me, if you will, to the 119th Psalm. You know when you go to the 119th Psalm, my favorite among the Psalms, you know, there are lots of things about the 119th Psalms. There's a lot of unique things about it. But one of the great things about this psalm, one of the things that I love the most about this psalm, and there are many things I love about it, but I believe David wrote it. And if he did, David is saying here to God, he's speaking to God, and he gives us a demonstration of what Solomon, his son, would eventually tell you and I to do. When Solomon said, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, I submit to you that he learned that first and foremost from his very own father. The, or the 119th Psalm, look at verse 2. He says, blessed are those who keep his testimonies. And who seek Him, notice it, with the whole heart. With the whole heart. 
There's no half-hearted religion for David. No half-hearted devotion from David. David says to the Lord that uh, those who keep his testimonies are those who seek him with the whole heart. Drop down to verse 10. David says, with my whole heart, I have sought you. If you turn over to verse 34, give me understanding and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it. With what? With my whole heart. Verse 58, I entreated your favor with my whole heart. Verse 69, the proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. No half-hearted religion here. No divided devotion among David. And he says, trust in the Lord. How are you going to do that? There's only one way to do that and be pleasing to God. And that is, you trust in the Lord with everything that you have. With every fiber of your being. You give God your whole heart. You know if you do that? There's a lot of questions that you'll never have to deal with. There are a lot of things in life that will be much simpler to you. For example, you won't have the question. Here's a question I sometimes hear. Are we going to church tonight? You ever heard that? You know, that's never been heard that I ever recall in our house. Our boys grew up in a house. They never asked that question. But I think it's asking a lot of homes. You see, when we give God our whole heart, there's no question where we're going to be when God's people meet. When God's people come together, when there are opportunities to worship God, there's no question about that. Why? Because I have already demonstrated my trust and my wholehearted devotion to God. And he says, trust in the Lord with a focus. And you give him everything you've got. You focus. You trust in the Lord with all your heart. You see, we must not be divided in our trust. James talked about those who do. He talked about a man who was a double-minded man. And you know what he said about him? He's unstable in all his ways. What's that mean? He's wishy-washy. He's wishy-washy. You don't know if he's going to be at church or not. He may be here tonight. He may not be here tomorrow night. He may not be here the rest of the week. He's wishy-washy. When it comes to his business deal, sometimes he maybe does the right thing, maybe sometimes he doesn't. Maybe he's not as honest as he should be sometimes. You see, we don't have to worry about things like that. If we've given God our heart, if we're serving Him with our whole heart, we're going to be a person of integrity. We're going to be a person of honesty. We're going to be a person of faithfulness to God in all things. That's what Solomon says that we're to do. And notice the words at the top of that slide that you see on the screen behind me. That doesn't say the suggestion. It doesn't say the opinion. It says the command. Solomon doesn't ask us to do this. It's a command. It's a direct command. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. But in the second place, let us notice that Solomon followed that up with a word of caution. Then he says, lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. You see, he says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And we need to do that. But then he comes back with this word of caution and he says, listen... Lean not on your own understanding. You know who needs to hear that? I need to hear that. I need to hear that. I need to be reminded of that frequently. 
You know why? Because there are some times in life I catch myself maybe thinking too much of myself. And I get the feeling that maybe I can do this on my own. You know when things are going well in life? You know when everything's going pretty well? You know what we do? We begin to think more highly of ourselves perhaps than we ought to think. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. There's a tendency to do that. But we must always remember that through the peaks and the valleys of life, God is there for us in both places. And we need to give, the God, give God the honor and glory when things are going well in life. And we need to lean on Him with everything we've got when things aren't going so well. And I must not get the idea that I can live this life and I, I, I'm smart enough and I'm strong enough and I'm able to do this on my own. That I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps and I can do this. God wants me to understand you can't do this alone. So Solomon, in his wisdom, reminds Terry, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't be leaning on your own understanding. Don't be trusting in your own abilities. Don't be trusting in your own strengths. You remember what Paul said when he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The famous preacher Dwight Moody once said, trust in yourself and you're doomed to disappoint. Trust in your friends and they will die and leave you. Trust in money and you may have it taken from you. Trust in your reputation and some slanderous tongue may blast it. But trust in God and you are never to be confounded in time or eternity. I like what Jeremiah said. Chapter 10 and verse 23. When he said, O oh Lord, I know, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. And that's what Solomon said. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't be trying to direct your own steps. You allow God to be in charge of your life. You allow Him to direct your steps and order the way before you. It was Isaiah who said in chapter 5 and verse 21, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Thirdly this evening, let's notice the confession. Here in verse 6, we see that he goes on to say, In all your ways, in all your ways acknowledge him. What does that mean? It means that as I go about my daily life and everything that I do, I acknowledge the working of God in my life. Jesus kind of said it like this. When he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When we go about our daily life, what are we to do? We are to allow our Christian light to shine. People ought to be able to look at us, to look at the way that we live our life. They should be able to listen to the way we talk. They should be able to consider the way we think. They should be able to look at the way that we live our life and to know that we are intent on living life in a good way according to the will of God. Acknowledge Him in all thy ways. We must live with an awareness of God's involvement in our life. I think there's a good illustration of that in the 23rd Psalm. I'd like to ask you, if you would, to turn your Bible to Psalm 23. I'd like to share something with you for just a moment uh, to illustrate what we're talking about here. And I'm going to read the 23rd Psalm. If you'll bear with me and follow along if you would allow me to do so, I'm going to read the 23rd Psalm with a little bit of variation for the purpose of illustrating this point. It begins, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord makes me to lie down in green pastures. The Lord leads me beside the still waters. The Lord restores my soul. 
The Lord leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For the Lord is with me. The Lord's rod and the Lord's staff, they comfort me. The Lord prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The Lord anoints my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know when you read it like that, you know what David gives us the impression that he was acknowledging God in all of his ways. In everything that he spoke of in this psalm, what is he doing? He is acknowledging that it is the gift of God, that it's the working of God, that it's the provision of God, that it is the protection of God. All of those things, he is acknowledging God in all of his ways. Titus 2 and verse 7 says, In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. But then fourthly tonight, let's notice the care. He says, in all your ways acknowledge him. And then he says this in verse 6, and he shall direct your paths. You see, trusting in the Lord results in him directing our paths. The word direct here means to make smooth or straight. You know, to get up here, I, I, I travel Route 74 and 18 and 180 and Route 2. Now, if you know anything about those roads, you know that you're pretty much taking your life in your own hands. You know, <laughs> every time that you, you travel that path. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's known for, you know, uh, not being the, you know, may, maybe not a tourism route. There are lots of potholes. Uh, it's heavily traveled by water trucks and dump trucks and sand trucks and all kinds of large equipment. So it's always in a state of disrepair. Pretty rough in some places. Then every once in a while, they do a little, little, little road construction, and, and for a little while, man, it is smooth. You've got to enjoy it when you can, because it's not going to last long. You know that. It's not going to last long. But you like it when there are those that come through, and they put down that new pavement. And we get to enjoy that for a little while. This word direct here means to make smooth or straight. Uh, we would say he will pave the way. That's the idea here. When we trust in the Lord with all of our heart and in all our ways we acknowledge him, when we lean not on our own understanding and we allow him to direct our paths, he is going to make smooth the way. He's going to pave the way for us. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Isn't that a wonderful mental picture to think as you live your life, as you live your life and you allow the Lord to direct your steps, the image here is of the Lord being out there in front of us and He's paving the way for us. He's paving the way as we live our life. It's because He cares for us. He loves us. And Peter says in 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, casting all your care upon Him. For He cares for you. And because He cares for you, you know what He does? He directs your, your paths. He will make your way straight. He will pave the way for you. You know, in Psalm 37, once again, this is the third time we quoted Psalm 37. My favorite verse of that psalm is verse 25. There David said, I have been young and now I am old. And yet... I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. You know, I'm old enough now that I can look back on enough years that I can say that I concur with what David said. I have been young. And now I'm older than I've ever been. 
And I agree with David, I have not yet seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Why? Because of the care of God. The righteous trust in the Lord with all of their heart. The righteous lean not on their own understanding, but they put at the feet of Jesus and trust with their whole heart in the promises of God, which includes the promise to care for the problems and the difficulties that we face in life. You see, it is the case. That God loves us and he cares for us. But we've got to trust in him. And we've got to do it with all of our heart. When I was, or when our sons were young, when they were little boys, they're great big boys now, they're both way bigger than I am. But many years ago, when they were just little guys, they loved to play this game. You probably played this game, you know, with your children as well. But they love to get up on a, you know, a stand, a table, or something. They love to get up on that, and they would jump. And I would catch them. You ever play that? We'd do that. And I'd stand there, you know, and they'd say, catch me, Daddy, and they'd jump, and I'd catch them. And they'd want to do it again, so I'd put them back up there, and I'd, I'd step back, and they'd jump, and I'd catch them. And then, you know, as they got older, you know, we got, it got a little more risky. And I may take a step back, you know, and they jump and I catch them. I may take another step back. They jump and I catch them. I had to be really careful because after a while, they just get up there and jump. Whether I was ready or not, they just jump. And I had to make sure, I had to be very careful that I was always ready because I knew they were going to jump. Why would they do that? Why did they do that? They did that without any care whatsoever. They did that with absolutely no fear whatsoever. And I submit to you that they did that because they knew that there was not a chance in the world. that their father would not catch them. They knew there was not a chance. They had no fear whatsoever. In a very primitive way, Solomon is saying, jump. Do you trust in the Lord with all of your heart? Do you trust in the promises of God to the extent that you're willing to walk by faith and not by sight? Are you willing to face the difficulties of life knowing that the Lord is there, that He will see you through? You see, we must always trust in the Lord that He will catch us when we fall, that He'll protect us from harm. And it all begins with our trusting in His power to save us from our sins. And all of this means very little if we haven't trusted in Him to the point that we're willing to obey the gospel to become a child of His. If you're here tonight and you're not a child of God, you need to be one. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Notice that you can't have the forgiveness of your sins. You can't be saved from your sins unless you first have the right kind of faith. Not just an acknowledgement of God, but a belief in God and a belief in Jesus Christ His Son as the Savior of the world. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. That He is able to save us from our sins. That He died on the cross, that He shed His sinless blood, that through that sacrifice we could become a child of God through obedience to the gospel. And that involves our being baptized into Christ 
And if you haven't yet done that, we invite you to do that tonight. Step out by faith. Come to Jesus. Be baptized for the remission of your sins that you might become a child of God tonight. You can leave here a part of the family of God. And you can live and trust and faith in God and heaven can be ultimately your eternal home. If you've been unfaithful to the Lord, if you've not been trusting in the Lord as you should, why not repent of that and return tonight? If we can assist you in any way, we want to do that very thing. Will you come as we stand and as we sing?